One thing uh, the director asked me to do is to share with you uh, a cyber analytical framework that we do. This is primarily actually an internal document, one that uh, we generated to help us understand where to make the investments, how to make the choices. Uh, what do you invest in? What do you not invest in? How do you know those investments are, are, are good things? How are they closing the gaps that we've heard about? Or are they not? Um, and that's what we did, and it guides a lot of our action, and you'll hear that picked up by a number of the PMs. Um, it's been requested, and we've ended up giving it to a lot of the senior government leadership, but um, the way I look at it is this is really a, a document that we sort of use to help get our arms around the, the cyber issues, at least as we saw them. This is an abridged version of it, uh, for obvious reasons, because I think the PMs are more interesting than me, but uh, give you a little bit of flavor of this. So where all these analytical frameworks start is by trying to just understand, separate sort of what's real from what's not real, what really are the problems. We hear a lot of things you heard about earlier, a couple of the speakers talked about the hype. So we just try to get a little bit of ground truth, because at heart we're engineers, right? We're not policy people. So there are really four things that we hear. The first thing we hear is that attackers can penetrate our architecture easily. We hear that all our systems are yeah, everyone can get into them, there's no problem, everybody can get on to them, and we, we wondered how true is that. So we actually sponsored an, an internal effort. We took a HBSS compliance system, so for those of you in the government, you know what that is. If you're not, just think about your fully up to patch, you know, semantic or McAfee, you know, system. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was as fair as possible. And uh, two people, three days for a cost of about $18,000, we got inside the system with a whole bunch of escalation privileges, found a whole lot of different exploits. Uh, and you compare that to the millions of dollars a year that we spend for software and licenses alone for HBSS. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a bash HBSS talk. It is not the case, you know, so you could be cynical and say, well, what if I didn't do it? Would my life be better? You know, categorically, no. All we're trying to suggest to you is that if you think that's the be-all and end-all solution, that's not it. So that's the first thing we heard and, and found that it was quite true. Second thing we heard, and you heard that in one of the talks, uh, you hear this all the time, the users are the weak link, right? We build these great systems if it just wasn't those stupid users. Um, that bothers me a lot, and I think it actually misses sort of a key point, which is there's a flip side to security, which we haven't talked a lot about today, which is mission effectiveness. And you need to look at them at the same time. And so I want you to picture, if you will, a, a three-star general, or we had some here today, and he's leaning on some poor sergeant major. And he wants a piece of information, and he wants it right now. So if you crawl inside the sergeant major's head after he gets over the, oh my god, a three-star's talking to me, it goes something like this. Gee, the information he wants, I need to go to another computer system. I don't know how to transfer that file over there unless I use this little thumb drive. And I know I'm not supposed to do that. But somehow, the, the risk of me doing that seems somewhat ephemeral. Uh, it's, I don't know exactly what's going to happen to me. I've done it before. Nothing bad's happened. And my favorite, I'm only going to copy one file, right? which is sort of the five-second rule of cyber. Um, <laughs> and I can weigh that risk on this side. And then I risk displeasing the three-star general who's standing right here. And it's a pretty easy decision to make. And so we make that decision. And so I think as we go off and we talk about security, we also need to remember that the whole point is we could be completely secure. We could just get rid of computers. So we have to wrestle with this. And, it, and it's tough. As we layer things on and on, I don't know about other people, but if you're on a government computer like I am, you, know, you can boot your computer, go to Starbucks, come back, and it's still booting. And so that's what turns our users into enemy assets or into you know, weak links. And my answer is it's, it's not them, it's us, right? Third thing we hear, and we've heard a lot about this, is that the supply chain is compromised. Um, in this case, and I, when we did this slide, I want to be clear, I'm not picking on the F-35 who knew that it would be so politically charged. All I meant was a modern jet fighter. And you look at that, out of 3,500 uh, integrated circuits, roughly three quarters of them or so are manufactured overseas, right? Two-thirds of the ASICs are manufactured in China and Taiwan specifically. Now, again, I want to be clear. This isn't to say that every single airplane is now compromised. We don't have knowledge of that. That may not be the case. But it is the case that we don't know. 
And again, I want to caution, because the knee-jerk reaction we've seen when I've given this talk uh, to some places is, oh, well, I know the answer. We're just going to build a secure foundry here in the United States. Um, that's just not going to scale. Uh, if you talk to people like Dr. Gabriel, who lived in that business, um, you may be able to build some small things yourselves, but you're not going to be able to build that. And so we need to look at these things. It's not just a software problem, but it's a hardware problem, too. The fourth thing we hear is that our physical systems, our cyber physical systems, are, are vulnerable to attacks. I think many of you have probably seen the study that came out of UCSD and uh, University of Washington where an uh, American uh, uh, sedan was compromised. Uh, they used a Bluetooth exploit, they got onto the CAN bus, and they took over pretty much everything. What you see in that screenshot is uh, the speedometer going 140 miles an hour in park. I don't know what that car says up there, but I know it doesn't say pwned by car shark. And so you look at that, and it's a really important talk because um, we often take, when you see a lot of classic cyber uh, you know, presentations and the like, you often see all the little clip art. We've all seen this pitch, right? It's little clip art computers with little clip art lightning bolts with little puffy clouds and then little red bugs to show you the bad part. And the thought was, you know, it's much broader than that. Um, computers are in everything. We had a recent uh, car manufacturer come over and they said that uh, there are over 100 basically small computers inside a modern car today. And so we look at all these things as things that are vulnerable and things we need to do something about. So we have this general feeling that we're doing a lot and yet somehow we're losing ground. And it feels somehow fundamentally un-American, right? Because we're all told from a young age, if you work really hard and you apply yourself and you spend the right resources, then things are supposed to get better. And that's often the case. It does not feel to be the case in cyber at all. And so we see charts like this, which you've probably seen, where you see the number of bugs, uh, and these are just reported incidents. So you now think about the really important ones, or obviously the unreported ones, so who knows how high that number goes, and the billions of dollars we spend on the problem. And the chart sort of leads you to believe that if that red line's going up in money, that somehow these incidents should be coming down, and they're not. And that leads us to, again, the point of today, and part of our research says, OK, so why? That uh, piece of paper sat on my desk door for about six weeks. I just walked in every day, it just looked me in the face. So why? What, what's going on? Why are we spending more resources and time and things don't get better? And uh, we were stomied for quite a while. In fact, the whole cyber PMs were all over there. Hello, cyber PMs. Uh, they basically shut down our office and sat down and started to work at it. And this is where this first chart came from. We started to look at this, and what you see on the uh, x-axis are just the years, and on y-axis are lines of code. There's no magic to lines of code. It's simply a proxy for work effort. Uh, you can think about it as uh, number of people hours, you can think about it as money, you can think about it any way you like, it's just the amount of work. And what's really interesting on this blue line is although we picked on security software, it doesn't really matter. You can do this for operating systems. You can do this for applications. You can do this for anything you like. In the case of uh, security software, you'll see by 2005, we're at 10 million lines of code. Think about unified threat management as your Tivoli and your semantics and the like. And then we took 9,000 pieces of malware, averaged them out. Obviously, some pieces of malware are much larger, and some are smaller, but some are as small as one line. Uh, and they averaged out to 125 lines of code. And just to give you an idea of how small 125 lines is, where we drew the red line on this chart is 250,000. If I draw it at 125, it doesn't even appear. So no matter where you want to draw that line, you can see this divergence. And that was sort of the aha moment for us, which said, look, we are clearly divergent with this threat. I mean, imagine that we're playing a poker game, and we'll say lines of code are a dollar. So that means we're in the following game. Uh, all in poker, you bet 10 million, they bet 125 bucks. How many rounds do you want to play? Uh, when Mudge gave that talk at a, at, a, at a hacker conference, somebody stood up in the back and said, one more round, please. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, we have now have him, so we're going to try to get off this, uh, get, see if we can get off this blue line and onto the red line somehow. The other thing we learn is that you know, the human is always in the loop. So this was really uh, an interesting study uh, where they were trying to crack at DEF CON a bunch of passwords, right? 
And there were 53,000 passwords. The winning team got 38,000 of them in 48 hours. What you're seeing on MedX Access, if your eyes aren't great, that's just, uh, that's all that is is 48 hours. I actually don't think the, the speed which they crack them, though alarming, is the telling thing. I think what was most interesting to us is if you follow the way this chart goes. So if you look at the very beginning of the chart, at the origin, you'll see a fairly flat line. This is when people are using brute force attacks. They don't really know what's going on, and they're just throwing out a wide net and trying to get a couple of things. And then they look and they say, oh, I see what they're doing. They're using 15 characters, right? So I, if, I don't know if, uh, if, if you have the same restrictions we do, but in the government, this is how our passwords work. We have to use 15 characters. I don't know about you, but I do not speak German, so I know no 15 character words. So, which is dangerous to say with the director of DARPA because she does speak German, but that's what happens when you have a smart boss. And so you probably do what I do, right? You take two words and you concatenate them, put them together. And then they make your life more complex. They say, oh, no, 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 but it needs a, it needs a special character. Go, well, I'll fix you, I'll put, ampersands are good. I'll just put that in between the two words. And then you need a special uh, symbol, so you think, well, that, that's good. And then they tell you, oh, by the way, we're gonna change this every 90 days. There's no way you're going to remember that, so you devise an ingenious foolproof system like you put a number at the end, and you increment it by one every day. And that's what this chart is showing you, is what happens. So you saw that flat part, they're looking at it, and then they say, oh, it's 15 letters, they put two words together, bang, and you see this huge spike where they're just getting lots of stuff. And then you notice up around 10,000, you see this flat part again. That's when that strategy has petered out, and then now they're casting about again, and then they say, oh, special character. They add special character and then they do it. And we see this happens again and again. So there's the hardware, there's software, and there's people. So here's something that uh, intrigued all of us. Um, we, were looking at, uh, we, we were looking at security flaws, and this is the latest, uh, well, this is, I guess, now, at the time, uh, it was the latest now, it's probably about six months old or so. This is a patch list. So every time the government puts out uh, a list of software and we know that there are faults, they send out to everyone saying, these are known faults in, in the software. What's interesting is, off this list of 17, six of these were in the security software itself. To which again you think, well, okay, so why am I putting security software on there? Is that your, is that your message? No. So why does this happen? And I will tell you the key for why this is happening is actually seen in the earlier chart, right? When you're up at 10 million lines of code, it's not terribly surprising that when you add a new thing in that you create some new bugs. When you create new bugs, there are vulnerabilities. Which then led us to looking at this chart and it depends who you talk to, um, whether, you, you know, I come out of Microsoft, so I, I you know, uh, no laughing. We said that uh, we would look at about five bugs per thousand. Uh, some people argue it's down as low as one, but however you look at it, when you're at hundreds of millions of lines of code, you're finding a lot of exploitable space. And that made us sort of look at this thing as a surface area of attack. So what you're seeing here on this chart, on the x-axis, uh, what you're looking at is uh, just file size. So you would have this sort of notion that would say, well, gee, if I have a small program, somehow that should be easier to defend than a large program. It just logically makes sense. So if you take a small program like uh, Microsoft Calculator, I don't know, you probably put that file size down around 2025, somewhere around there. Uh, you take something bigger like uh, Microsoft Excel, that's probably up around the 150, maybe slightly larger file size, and you would think, well, gee, okay, it's easier to, to defend and protect calculator than it, than it is Excel. And if you just look at that red bar and what you're seeing when you look at the number of function calls, that looks right. Until you realize that's just not how modern operating systems work, right? So today our modern operating systems open, use DLLs, so they call in. So if you actually look at the number of DLLs and how much is actually exposed, that's the green line. So when you add in all the green to all the red, what you end up is you find out that line, that dotted line across the top on the red is, there's no such thing as small programs or big programs. They're all big programs. They all have these large surface areas of attack, and we need to find some way to reduce them, because actually an attack in the green is potentially much more dangerous than an attack in the red. Because if I get an attack in the green, it means I compromise every single program there. So, that which we don't do with technology to hurt us, we, we tend to mandate. We do this by mandate. 
So this is a, a memo that came out, and I want you to pay attention to the part we pulled out because they've concatenated two different phrases, one which I agree and support, and one that got, I sort of think lumped in there and, and, and I disagree with. So it says, uh, to improve information security and, and reduce overall IT operating costs. So pause there for a minute. Those are two radically different things. One is securing information, and one is improving op overall operating IT costs. We're gonna put everybody on the same system. That's what it says. Okay, so I buy the fact that it will save us money. Right? It's easier to administer, it's easier to be up to patch, there are clearly advantages to that. To somehow make this wild jump that says, well therefore we're also more secure, I don't see any foundation for it. And so we need to look at both of those at the same time. So, at this point what we really come to is the following conclusion. Our approach to cybersecurity is dominated by a strategy that layers security onto a uniform architecture. We do this to create tactical breathing space, but it's not convergent with the evolving threat. And I wanna be really clear, it's very important, this sort of realization. This is not to say that we should stop with firewalls. Much like Bruce was saying, right? It's not, we're not gonna stop with any of this. We need to do this stuff. We need to keep our systems up and operational. The analogy that we often use is it's sort of like being in an airplane and, and getting shot down over, over the ocean. And if, you know, nobody here up here is gonna to try to tell you not to tread water, it's a good step one. But if that is your entire strategy, three days later, you're still in the middle of the ocean and very tired. And so it was this sort of realization that started to change the way we looked at cyber and some of the investments we made. And then we had a second sort of tough epitome, sort of tough uh, revelation, which is, uh, I think particularly tough for DARPA, since we're all sort of geeks and, and, and revel in it, we think that technology is always the answer. We just need to make a bitter widget and then all will be fine. Uh, and it became clear that technology is not the only culprit, but it's not all, it can't be the only answer. And one really interesting example of that is a DARPA program called Trust. So I am not a microelectronics guy by any means, but the simple way to think about trust is, the, the problem we have is, when I design a chip and I send it out to foreign manufacturers we talked about, how do I know that the chip I got back is actually the chip that I submitted? And this is sort of an approach that uses a, a effectively x-ray lithography. It allows you to look at it and then compare and say, yes, this looks right and it looks right. So that's the good news. And if you look at that second red box, it'll show you that's where we are in the program in second phase. And what you'll see is we have a reasonably high probability of detection. We have a pretty low probability of false alarm. And then the news gets a little worse because then you look at the number of transistors we're doing. And then I want you to compare that to the fact that a single FPJ today has 400 million transistors. And you look at the amount of time it takes us to do that chip and you reach the following conclusion. While we certainly can check a chip and some number of chips, we are not checking all the chips. And so somehow we need to work hand in hand with policy. Again, you can, people who know me know I am not a diplomat. But one can imagine working things together to, you can imagine sanctions, right? So, uh, you know, the analogy for me is it's much like trying to stop drugs coming into America. It's a very difficult thing to do. We know we can't always succeed. But you put, dro but you put dogs in the airports. So what's the advantage of doing that? Well, the answer is not all the dogs can always be there, but there is a message that if you do bring it in on that day that the dogs are there, the odds of you getting caught are extremely high and the consequences are severe. And so you'll sort of self-edit that behavior. And, and one can imagine taking a technology like trust to do the same thing, telling people that if you send it in and we happen to be sampling that one, now we, you know you will be caught and this consequence will be severe. Next comes to sort of a long chart, um, but I think it's a fun one and, and an important one, so I'll give you the bottom line up front, which is one mistake I think we make in cyber a lot is we forget the adversary gets a move, right? You think, well, we'll go do something, and then somehow as if, I don't know, the enemy just says, oh, well played, DARPA. <laughs> you, you win again. <laughs> so it, it doesn't actually work that way, sadly. Um, and so what we took as an example, uh, we took a botnet, assuming if you're here in this meeting, you, you know botnet, so I will spare you the, my, my, my interpretation of them. Uh, but that is why you get all your spam. Uh, and so what they did was they moved from a peer-to-peer -peer 
um, to, to uh, they, I'm sorry, they move from a, from a hierarchical to a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, botnet. And in order to do that, you need to obscure the communications, and they used a simple XOR. And the pattern works something like this. They do an XOR obfuscation, and it would take the antivirus guys, the AV guys, about a week to 10 days. They got to find the signature, they got to reverse engineer it, come up with a patch, test it, and then send it out to us. And then the botnet guys bang in a new XOR string, takes about five, 10 minutes, and they're off and running and they get another week to 10 days. And this game was going on for a long time. And then one day, the, the guys who controlled the bot uh, used AES, right? Put it together, a nice implementation of some advanced encryption, and waited for a, a response from the antivirus community. Five days goes by, 10 days, 20, no response, 30, no response. So at this point, you would think the botnet guys would go, well, we've won. So they just stay on this, and this is good. And they did something that seemed odd. They stopped and moved back up to XOR. Seemed very strange, and it reminds me of, I don't know if people are movie fans, but if you are, in Rounders, there's this great line that there's always a sucker at the poker table. If you don't know who it is, it's you. <laughs> So I'm not a big fan of sort of subscribing, subscribing to the notion that uh, my adversary is dumb or the JV team. I think it's often I don't understand the game. So while we don't know, we have an inkling of what's going on. So imagine looking inside the, the people who are on the botnet's head and their calculation goes something like this. Well, we can stay on AES, which is nice, but the AV guys can't let it go forever. Sooner or later, they're going to mass a big R&D effort. They're going to go over, and they're going to stop this. And when they do, I don't know how far their fix is going to go. It may wipe out my entire communications node. It may wipe out the branch, the tree, or even the root. And that seems really bad. On the other hand, if I live in this XOR world, I mean, OK, so every 10 days, I got to work for five or 10 minutes. That seems really safe. That's a good, that's a good economic incentive for me. Here's where it gets weird. So no collusion whatsoever. Let's crawl inside the head of the antivirus people. So how do antivirus people make money? Subscriptions, I hear you all cry. Yes. <laughs> all right, so now let's think, about the, let's think about them for a minute, and they say as follows. Well, gee, that AES thing is going to be really hard, and it's going to cost me millions of dollars, and uh, I'll put it in, and it's one solution, and I'll send it out to you. Or if I live up in this thing, every week I get to send you a love mail from my company telling you how many things I've stopped for you and why you're paying me $39.95 a month. And you're happy and I'm happy. So you're in this really strange space where you actually have the AV guys on one hand and the botnet people actually having the exact same goal and the exact same outcome. The only people that get screwed are, well, you and I. So. What, what sums up at this point is what we realized is there came up with what I think are a lot of, I, I would say, false choices, right? We know that we would like our users to be the best line of defense, but I don't accept that therefore we have to impede operations, right? We know a layer defense would be great, but why and where is it written that that means I necessarily have to increase the surface area for attack? We heard a lot about heterogeneous systems. We all know there's huge advantages to them. But the cry you hear from the IT ma makers, and which is quite correct, is, well, man managers, is, well, they're inherently unmanageable. But again, it's a DARPA question to ask ourselves why. These things aren't written in stone. These are just things we've accepted over time. And so what we try to drive our programs to were to try to break these false choices and try to provide some answers. So, Here's a little bit of the mea culpa. I always worry about this talk a little bit because it sounds a little preachy, right? You know, sort of, you bad, DARPA good, right? Which is not the message at all. The truth is, we missed it too. If you look at our investments, they weren't necessarily, they, although they, they were profitable, I would say what they did was they were in the treading water area. They were gaining us some tactical advantages, but they weren't getting convergent. And what we tried to do was to shift some of that burden and try to move some of those resources to getting convergent. Now, we'll still do the tactical breathing space programs. We need to do it. And the question that came to us is, we need to broaden, as I opened this morning, we need to broaden the number of people we talk to and we need to ask better questions. So this is addressed to you too. So we need your help and we're actually asking for your help to let's fix it.